Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. But who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts, where I am a board-certified criminal defense lawyer, reacting to music, reacting to um, various videos. And today we're doing part two of what pretending to be crazy looks like. Now, uh, this is the Parkland shooter, um, and we got about you know a good chunk of the way into watching the uh, interrogation. Now, when when you are taken into custody a, on a criminal case, uh, you are and they want to take your statement. They have to do two things, or there's two elements in order to invoke Miranda. Number one, you have to be in custody, and number two, there has to be interrogation, which is what we have here. So, uh, let's say that the officer didn't read him as Miranda rights. Well, he's in custody and he's asking him questions. So, if he did not read him as Miranda rights um, and have an effective waiver, then Everything he talks to him about gets suppressed. However, if he decides to testify, they can use that statement to cross-examine him with. So without further ado, here's the second part of uh, the Parkland shooter, and let's see what else he has to say. It's a phone. What's the number? Now, if you remember... Uh, from before, uh, there was a marked difference between when he is uh, in the room with the detective as opposed to when the detective leaves the room. You, you can see a noticeable change in the demeanor and the actions of, uh, of this dickhead. Okay. He will now begin to feign a state of hysteria, which then morphs into a simulated panic attack and fake hyperventilation. The detective will need to refute the act immediately as to not let the subject gain confidence with it, but he also has to maintain rapport and avoid confrontation. He essentially has to tell the subject to knock it off, but in the most oh. passive manner possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nick, Nick, calm down. You've already been medically cleared. I know what's going to be talked about is difficult, but again, you don't remember your phone number. How long you had the phone? So he, one of the things that they probably did in this case is take him to a hospital. That's why you see him in a hospital account. And uh, I don't know exactly what happened prior to him uh, getting in the interrogation in the interrogation room that required him to go to the hospital might have just been some odd behavior or maybe they beat the shit out of him i don't know uh but it's you don't always go to the hospital so uh the fact that he was medically cleared um tells me that you know somebody and maybe he went for a psych but that tells me that he uh he had to go to the hospital they looked him over they said he was fine how long have you had the phone Nick, the doctor's already looked at you. Okay. Okay, you're fine. You're not having any problems at the moment, and you're perfectly fine. So calm your breathing down, all right? And, and I want to believe certain things that you're going to tell me, but, you know, if we're getting put where you're going to hyperventilate over a phone number. At any time, what this guy doesn't know or doesn't realize, he's got the power to end the, the interview. At any time, you can say, I want my lawyer and the interview stops. You can say, I don't want to answer any more questions. The interview stops. But one of the things that they do, even though they might inter end the interview, they'll let him sit there in a room like that with a with video going. And you think for a second that, uh, okay, well, they're gone. I can do whatever. They're still recording everything he does. And they can use every bit of that as, uh, as evidence at trial. Okay. All right. All right. So, what's your phone number? Huh? Uh, nine five four. Okay, nine five four. The manic episode is somewhat curbed, but the subject is still clearly committed to it. Nine five four eight two one. Two zero zero seven. Two zero zero. One zero zero seven. And again, going back to what kind it is. Do you know if it's an iPhone, a Samsung? How long have you had? 
Every kid knows what the phone is, man. I got kids your age. Yeah, he's absolutely right. Every kid would know. And and I don't know why he's doing this. I mean, maybe he thinks he's going to game. You can tell he's not wearing any socks. Um, he's got no street clothes on, so he's not. he's got to be uncomfortable. His feet have got to be cold. Um, and the whole idea is get, keep him talking. Keep him talking. Um, if he had his wits about him, he would just shut up. But, I, you know, like we said before, they don't really need this confession in order to show that he's the shooter because they kind of have him cold. But they want to have him talk about this so that they have answers for the victim's families uh, later on. I know I heard about that. That's what I was going to talk about next. This is a turning point. Cruz's adoptive mother had indeed passed away the year prior from pneumonia. The topic is sympathetic towards himself, and it seems to have stopped the feigned hysteria in its tracks. Compared to his neurotic behavior in the minutes leading up to this moment, he all of a sudden appears calm. He is clearly receptive, and thus responsive, to the cue of compassion when it's directed at himself. The detective recognizes this, and although he said he would talk about the subject's mother next, he instead focuses on it immediately to keep him engaged. All right. So, but you had, since your mom died, how long has your mom passed? I can't remember, I think. Okay. This November. year or last year? November. No. November? Okay. Okay, when you were, when your mom passed, were you living with her? Yes. Okay, what city was that? Parkland. Parkland? The subject drops the act and becomes more engaged in the conversation. The detective inquires further about his mother for roughly three minutes before shifting the discussion. It focuses mainly on the subject's background, and he first declares that he was depressed for the majority of his childhood. He then reveals his history of drug use, which consists of marijuana and Xanax. After that, he claims to have attempted suicide by alcohol poisoning two years ago, but in his own words, was able to sleep it off. He then states that he was employed at the Dollar Tree for the last two years working as a cashier. So one of the things that is important to notice in this is that as he's able to recall details, as he's able to um, basically conceptualize um, various facts, dates, times, events, it takes away the mental health part of it. Because all they have to show is that he knew right from wrong, basically, and that he can aid in his defense. Those are, it's, it's pretty simple. Hold down a job for two years, that's pretty good, right? Yes. Other than Dollar Tree, where else did you ever work? Lawnmowing. What? Lawnmowing. Lawnmowing? Oh, okay. All right, when you tried to kill yourself with alcohol, your mom was still alive. What were you depressed about back then? Loneliness. Loneliness? Loneliness. Friends? No friends? Or what's what, what, what kind of loneliness? I mean, everybody gets lonely. Solitude. Solitude? You don't have a lot of friends? No. Okay. Um, today, when I say today, starting from last night when you went to bed to this morning, did you do any kind of drugs at all? Any Xanax, any marijuana, anything like that? No. Okay. The subject reveals that he has a biological brother whom he was adopted with. He then claims to have been making $1,200 a month at the Dollar Tree. The discussion now lands on what his aspirations were. When you weren't depressed, well, what did you want to be when you got out of school? A ranger. A ranger? An army ranger? Did you ever apply, fill out any paperwork to try to go to the army? I, t I took the ASA and failed. Okay, well, why'd you fail? Because I was stupid. You're what? I'm stupid. You're stupid? Okay. Were well, you going to take it again? I was afraid to take it. Okay. But you had aspirations to, to do something with your life. You wanted to be a, oh, that's a, that's a hell of a thing to want to be an Army Ranger. The discussion moves on to the subject's gun collection, which continues for roughly four and a half minutes. The attack on the school is yet to be mentioned, but the last gun to now be discussed was his choice of weapon to commit the massacre. What made you choose out of all the guns to want to buy an AR-15? Cool weapon. Cool Okay. Now when you bought it, I mean, it was a legitimate purchase, they gave you a receipt and everything, right? So you bought it legally, right? 
They filled, did you fill out those forms and everything? Okay, you remember those forms? Okay. The detective now shifts the topic onto his former high school, the same place he carried out the attack. Now, three years ago when you went... So, <clears throat> as this detective, one of the things that they do when they interview people is that they, 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 they chip around at the edges methodically. And they get you know, slowly to the, you know, it's like getting to the slowly to the center of the cookie. And in this case, that's exactly what he's done. He, now he's got the <clears throat> AR-15 in his hands, and uh, now he's going into the meat. To Douglas. And obviously he stopped going there. Why did you stop going there? My depression worsened. Your depression worsened? And what, what was going on? Is they, you know, did you just stop school on your own, or did some incident happen where? Yes, well, What was the incident that happened? Fought a kid. You fought a kid. You remember the kid's name? Yeah. Ian. And did you guys both get in trouble for the fight, or? Yeah. Okay. Well, what did they do? Suspend you? They suspended me. Okay. And what happened from there? Did you, after you got suspended, did you go back to school? Yeah. Okay, what happened? Why'd you stop going there then? I felt embarrassed. You felt embarrassed because you got suspended, or, or you felt embarrassed because of why? Because See, everything he, he talks about is, is how he is not worthy, how he's depressed, how he has, um, uh, he's stupid, um, you know, all these self loathing type of, uh, Thing that I it does, it's not helping him at all, but it, it does provide a, a profile and a motive. Okay. Well, what was, what was embarrassing about the fight? What were you guys fighting over? A girl. A girl. Well, what was embarrassing about it? I mean, did he even get the better of you? Was that what was embarrassing, or he yeah. just he think he got the better of you? Okay. He has just provided the state with a solid argument for a motive. Establishing a reason for an offense is critical when dealing with claims of insanity. It can not only indicate premeditation, but also calculated malice in connection to the crime, something considered absent in the mind of the criminally insane. He also asserts that he was lonely and depressed while attending the school, all of which can reinforce the argument that he was exacting revenge upon the community in which he felt ostracized. All right, so you go back to school. What ends up happening? You just stop going to school out there, or they, you got into more problems? Where they got into more problems. What was, the, what, was the, what was the more problems? Failing class. Okay. Not going to school. Okay. And this is all while your mom was... This is real common in these types of shootings where um, the kid just goes downhill. He's got nothing to look forward to, lack of hope, lack of um, anything going on in his life. And that's what it sounds like he had going on here. And so by doing something fantastical, and when I say fantastical, I don't mean uh, that it was great. I mean that it was outrageous and over the top, but fan and it more of like fantasy. Um, you know, you, you play these games, these first-person shooter games, and that's essentially what he was doing, you know. Um, and at that point, you got nothing to lose. That's why it's really important for everybody to have some kind of hope, some kind of direction, some kind of um, where do you want to go with your life. Have some plan in place, you know. Have a vision of where you want to be in five years. You know, failure to do that... Um, and act on those on those goals. You you know gives you doing that gives you hope. Failure to do that uh, takes away hope, and lack of hope can lead to depression. Why? Well, yeah. Okay. Did it come a point in time where you just stopped going there, or they expelled you? Well, I just stopped going, and then transferred me. They transferred you. When they transferred you, that that was that upsetting to you? Yeah. Okay. As we know, the suspect has made the claim about hearing a voice which he labeled the demon. The detective will now attempt to get a detailed narrative of these perceptual disturbances. He will do so by asking a series of open-ended questions, and then continuous follow-up questions thereafter. This will lock him into specific claims about what he was hearing. The more information he gives away, the less he will be able to amend later on. And the more questions that are posed, the more likely he is to make contradictions that can be used against him.
The suspect believes this is some type of clinical evaluation for the sake of his own well-being, and this misconception will become glaringly apparent later on. He, at this moment, is oblivious to the fact he is giving information away that will be used to cut through his own defense in years to come. So you go to the hospital, the doctor's cleared you, and you're, t and you're talking about demons. What are the demons? What is this? Well, tell me about it. See, the problem that you have here is you got a young kid, and the young kid thinks he's smart, and he thinks he, he says he's stupid, but he thinks he's smart. And so what he's going to do is try to, this is where he's, he thinks this is his opportunity to, um, to snow uh, those in front of him, to try to put forth this mental health defense. The voice is about it's, it's one. It's another voice, the evil side. Never? And what does the voice say to you? Burn, kill, destroy. Okay, burn, kill, destroy what? Anything. Okay, but have you ever burned, killed, or destroyed anything? What have you burned, killed, or destroyed? Uh, burned, just fire, set fire. To, to in what? Pit, in the pit, fire. Oh, a fire pit, okay, well. I mean, the voice told you to burn something, you built, built a fire, in a fire pit. What's destructive about that? That's what fire pits are made for. What else did the voice tell you to do that's... Kill animals. Okay, have you ever killed animals? Yes. What kind of animals? Birds. Birds? Wild birds or people's birds. pets? How do you kill them? Birds. How do you kill them? Wait for them, kill them. Oh, can't catch them, so how are you waiting for them? Work out in the, in the grass. See, he's just clearly he's just making shit up on the fly, and uh, when you're sitting there trying to pretend that you're crazy, um, just a little bit of questioning is all it takes to reveal that you're really not crazy. Wait for a bird to come up. There's no way, man. I'm, I'm a bird lover. There's no way you can't catch a bird, Holmes. No, I mean like. I, but, but, with the pelican? Oh, okay. Where's where's your pelican? It broke. Okay. Alright, so the voices tell you to, to, to herd animals and start fires in the fire pit. When was the last time you heard the voice? Yesterday. What time was it yesterday? It was at night. See, now look, now we're getting to the heart of the matter. So we've, we've eaten away at the edges. And and it's the demons and that and the the talk of the demons that have brought him now to to the uh, event. And look at his body language now. Now he won't look at him, uh, although I don't know he was really looking at him. But he's crouching down um, because now we're going to talk about you know the matter at hand. Okay. And where are we at? Work. You at work? So you're at Dollar Tree. What's the voice telling you? So if he's at Dollar Tree, if he says he was at work, let's say he wasn't at work, um, that would show some calculation on his part uh, to, to make himself all better than he was. In other words, I was at work. I'm a working person. This is what I do. But by doing what he did here, he's, already, he's giving facts and details that uh, will cut into his mental health defense. To hurt people. Hurt people at Dollar Tree? Or hurt people? Hurt people in general. Okay. Doesn't say specifically who? Alright. Can you tell how old the voice is? My age. Okay. Do you have a good voice too, or just a bad voice? Is there, is there, is there a voice inside you that says, do good things? The detective will now start getting confrontational, and the subject's behavior will shift once more in response. You will see him get defensive as he attempts to protect his narrative, and his responses will become much faster. He will even cut the detective off multiple times. Keep in mind that he was barely saying anything at the start of this interrogation. No? Can't be. You held down a job for two years. If you were doing things bad, you wouldn't be able to hold a job down for two years, right? Okay. I mean, look. Everybody it's has. Everybody. It's, every, me, it's me and then my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got a quote good and bad side. There's people. No, it's, it's, it's a voice. The voice is in here. 
And that is me. It's just regular me. Just trying to be a good person. Okay. Set aside his contradicting behavior for a moment and focus solely on his storyline. In his ideal scenario, we are to believe that he was battling these supposed voices and in his own words, trying to be a good person. Yet he was unable to reveal or seek help for this internal struggle until the very moment of his arrest. It was quite literally the second he was confronted with his comeuppance that his supposed demons came to light. Now that he is in custody, with the atrocities already committed, he is somehow able to maintain control over the force that was previously keeping him silent. But a deleted video that would later be extracted from his phone would tell a very different story. Hello. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds. I think I can do a good time. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll all know who I am. There are no signs of perceptual disturbances. When you have a situation like this, or like any criminal case, they get multiple sources of evidence. And people's cell phones are probably the treasure trove because we use them every day. I mean, they're so integral to what we do. And uh, this totally cuts against any kind of uh, mental health claim that he might have later because he's not he, he seems lucid he seems calculated he seems like this is going to be a big event um and really what it comes down to is he's got nothing to fucking lose because he's got no hope for anything he wants to just go out in a bang there's no anguish doubt hesitation or uncertainty when announcing his intentions by his own narrative, he claims to have continuously fought against the evil intentions of the voice. Yet, from a visual standpoint, there is no conflict in this video whatsoever. It's me and then my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got a quote good and bad side. There's people... No, it's, it's, it's a voice. The voice is in here. And that is me. Just trying to be a good person. Okay. But, obviously, again, when you say it's a voice, it's you. It's all you. The mean? voice is you as well. It's, yeah. The I, voice didn't force you to do anything, right? No, the voice did. It's two voices. Uh -huh. it, it, there's one half that's the good and then the bad. Yeah. His rapidly interchanging behavior has now gone from catatonic to manic to hallucinatory to now highly attentive and cautious. Okay, well, the voice tells me to go to lunch and not pay for my meal, but I pay for my meal because I know that's the right thing to do, right? Okay, let's talk about it. Did the voice, the voice didn't tell you to take Uber, right? Yes, it did. It did? Yes. The voice said take Uber. Yes. Did the, the voice, the voice is, is in me. But you're the voice. No. There's, there was, in, in here. Okay, it's in your head. Yes. What, is it a male voice or a female voice? Male. Male? The subject was beginning to panic, but the detective dials it in for the time being and switches the discussion back to more trivial matters. It seems that he wants to consult with the investigators outside before maximizing the pressure, and he re-establishes a certain level of trust before leaving the room. Let me go. I'm going to go back and uh, see what everybody's doing as far as uh, what they need me to do. And just so you know... <clears throat> While he's talking to the to, to him in this room, I, it's being recorded, but it's also being monitored by probably other detectives and his superior. Well, just or? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a 59-year-old man who's raised three children, so I guess that makes me somewhat of a psychologist. You can give me a psychologist here. Uh, I can certainly ask. Have you ever seen a psychologist before? The subject scratches his arm for another two minutes. He then switches to a hallucinatory state and appears to be seeing things in the room. Here. 
The detective will once more dismiss the act by pretending to not see it. He will then pose a question to the subject, and the charade will cease immediately. And you can tell when somebody's just doing some bullshit. Um, uh, you know, I mean, which that clearly is. You the water. Will you put it back over here? You definitely don't want the water, huh? It's very interesting to observe his facial expressions at the exact moments he abandons fake behavior. These are the very brief junctures in which his true self appears to surface. It's easy to get distracted by the present situation as he sits there in a hospital gown chained to the floor, essentially helpless to the cunning devices being used against him. But in moments like this, we are reminded of what we're actually dealing with. A very short time ago, he was not helpless at all. He was the one preying on the helpless, offering them none of the sympathy nor mercy of which he is now trying to garner for himself. All right, the school, or the psychologist you want to talk to. Obviously, I would have to tell him what you want to talk to him about. So what exactly do you, what, what do you want me to ask him? Or what, why do you want to talk to a psychologist? Find out what's wrong with me. Well, what do you think's wrong with you? I don't know. The detective in this next segment will attain further information about the supposed voices, only he will no longer have to tread carefully in order to maintain a friendly connection. He will still secure useful information, but also get confrontational as and when he pleases. The risk of frightening the suspect to the point where it stops the interrogation is no longer a concern. When you hear the voices, are the voices like outside your head or inside your head when you hear them? Inside. Okay, so it's not like... You don't hear a voice from that corner talking to you. It's inside your head. And is it always the, the same voice or is it only one voice? One voice, yeah. And you said it's, it's, a, it's a man's voice? It's, yeah. Yes. Does it sound like anybody you've ever met? Anybody you've ever seen on TV? Can you tell, like, by an accent? Is it a, what kind of, is it an old man, young man? See, by cross-examining him basically uh, on the voice, he, he and and trying to get as many details, um, anybody can can who's a psychologist could analyze and determine, you know, what are the common characteristics of uh, hallucinogenic uh, thought disorder, like paranoid schizophrenia, which is what he's basically saying here, and nothing he does will fit into that category, but by Doing what he's doing, the detective is basically pigeonholing him uh, with his re own responses. Hey man, oh, why? Yeah. Young man, about the same age as you, you think? Hmm. But it's only one voice you ever hear, right? Yes. Do you hear the voice when you're in bed at night sleeping? Yes. Do you ever see anything with the voice? Like, a, a, like you know... Some people say, oh, I see a person sitting in the corner. You don't see anybody sitting over there, do you? It's just me and you, right? All right. Do you always obey what the voice tells you to do? I try not to. Okay. Well, how many... On, on any given week, how many times do you think you hear the voice? All the time? Once every day. Once every day? Morning, afternoon, night? Always the same time? Usually in the afternoon. About what time? 11 to 12. Why do you think it's those hours? I don't know. See, that's just bullshit. It's always around lunchtime? That, that, that's just bullshit. I mean, and I don't know what time these shootings happen. My guess is probably around 11 or 12 or thereabouts. I mean, it just, it, that's not the way mental illness works. Now, you talked about demons, yeah. and then you talk about yeah, the voice. Yeah, that's a demon. That, the voice is a demon. The voice is the demon. So there's and not the two. Person, whoever it is. Does it have a name? My name Nick. My name is Nick. Is it use your name or use somebody else's name? Just a, just a, just a voice with no name. Well, just a voice with no name telling me what to do. Did the voice tell you to buy that AR-15? Yes. Did it tell you, hey, buy that gun? It looks cool. Did the AR-15 get picked out because it was similar to the gun that an army ranger would carry? No, it was because of the voice. What do you think if you, if you didn't buy it, if you say, hey, I ain't buying these guns, it's too expensive, what do you think the voice would have done to you? 
Do you stop talking to you? No, time I hurt myself. How how would you hurt yourself? Cut. You're a cutter. I'm a cutter. Okay. How I many? When was the last time you cut yourself? Earlier. Earlier when? When I was fishing. Earlier today or earlier? Earlier today. What were you fishing at today? At the, at a lake. Okay. Like, before the shoot. Thing. Before the school shooting. Yes. What were you? What did you cut yourself with? Knife. Those little scratches on your arms. Let me look at them. Come on, man. I get worse scratches weeding my flower bed than that. You weren't trying to hurt yourself. Yes, I was. It wasn't sharp enough. It wasn't sharp enough? No. How many knives do you have? Four, five. How long have you been cutting yourself? Years. Years? You ever cut yourself where you had to go to the hospital? So, if you've been cutting yourself for years, guess what we'd have? We'd have, like, a lot of scars on it. I've seen people who've cut themselves. And it's unmistakable. And it ain't like this. Get stitches? When you cut yourself, it's because the voice just told you to cut yourself. And if you didn't talk or you didn't listen to the voice, then you were going to be alone because your voice was your only friend. That's kind of what you're saying. Even though you have a biological brother. Since me and you have been talking, have you heard the voices? What's it said? To cut yourself. For you to cut yourself. Does the voice like me? Huh? Does the voice like me? It doesn't trust you. Why doesn't he trust me? I'm pretty relaxed, ain't I? I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure that out, too. Well, what does he like about me? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of grinning because I want to know what, what the voice's problem is with me. What doesn't he like about me? I treated you fairly. I've given you water. I talk nice to you, you know. You're too nice. I'm too nice, yeah. Um, How many times has the voice talked to you while we've been in the room here together? A lot. Has the voice said, jump out of the chair and do anything bad to that policeman? Saying, kill yourself now. There is a voice, to be honest with you. There is a voice. No, I don't think there is. I'm telling you the truth. There is. No. I mean, I feel you probably want to kill yourself because of what happened, but... No, the, the voice is telling me to kill myself. Okay, but the voice is telling you that the AR-15s is... You like guns, man. You want to be a ranger. You like guns. It's all right. There's cops like that. There's cops who got a 50 million guns. You didn't buy guns because the voice said, Hey, today I like Mossbergs. Tomorrow I like AR-15s. You like guns. Thank you. Call the psychologist. I, I, I get it. I've already got the questions from some of the psychologists. Some of the questions I asked you were I from. Said. Yeah. I see. That's the ones I asked you. You already? Mm -hmm. yeah. The questions were obviously from the investigation team and not a psychologist, but the suspect doesn't know this, and it's fascinating to observe his reaction when he sees the questions are not sympathetic in nature. He perhaps thought a psychotherapist would be asking him about his feelings and affording him some type of reassurance after he committed mass murder, and he becomes very unsettled once he realizes the procedure won't be quite as sympathetic. Voices, or the inside or outside of your head, what do the voices say? These are all questions I asked you. How many voices? You said one. Whose voice do you think it was? You didn't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand why you can't admit you like guns. You want to talk to a psychologist? Why didn't you talk to a psychologist when the voices started? The voice is telling me not to. And I listen. The voice was telling you not to talk to a psychologist? Yeah, but myself, I wanted to. Do you ever go to church? I wanted to. No, I'm saying ever in your life. Yeah. You believe in God? There, there's a term that they uh, use called malingering, which means you're kind of faking. Um, and he'd be so much better off just not giving a statement, you know, than, than pretending he's got some kind of mental health issues. Or if he wants to do this, he could go try to commit suicide in the jail, and then, then they'll put him in one of those suits that we saw – uh, one of the rappers um, in that, um, you know, when he was in court. And when, when you're in that, you know, that Velcro suit, um, you got no clothes on underneath it and you got no way to hang yourself. 
Um, but that's that's what real people with real problems do, not this kind of BS. Oh, well, you have got it. Well, you believe it. I feel like there's something. Okay. But if you believe in demons, if you believe in angels, angels is the good, demons are the bad. You, but when you say the word demon, you think it's an evil spirit? Or what do you think it is? I'm always... The subject had earphones in during the mass shooting. The topic now lands on the music he was listening to. Well, well I mean, I'm, I'm sure we don't like the same music. What kind of music we listen to? Name the, name the group. Well, what was it? Mark, Mark Twain. You have to help me. Mark what? Mark something. What was the song though? Sad. That's the name of the song. Sad. No. Uh, Salad days. Salad days? Hmm. Hold on a second. What else? Uh, oh, you listen to more than one song? What other song do you listen to? Um, just a lot of sad songs. All right. Did you pick the music yourself? Or did the demon the pick demon, the music? The demon and then myself, partially. All right, which ones did you pick? The sad ones. And which ones did he pick? The evil ones. The evil ones. What's an e what's e what give me an evil one compared to a sad one? You already gave me a sad one. What's an evil one? Penser Minch. What? Penser Minch. Pez Penser Minch. And what does that say? I don't know. I mean there's no lyrics to it? Oh, no. No, well there is lyrics, but I don't know what it means. But is is it in English? No. What language is it in? German. German? Do you, do you speak German? No. Then how do you know what the lyrics mean? I don't. So they could be happy, right? I don't know if they're happy or not. Well, again, yeah, you don't because demon, you can't speak it. The demon chose that I didn't choose. But, but you're up, you have one. How many think you had them on your, on your playlist? A long time. Okay, so you listen to them a lot of times? Hmm. So you had a playlist of music. The demon helped you pick out, but you picked out some of them. And how could you listen to the voices if you got all this yeah, music in your head? Understanding this demon thing. I know. Well, I don't Here's the other thing: nobody understands, which indicates he uh, probably told some people, according to him. But if nobody ever heard of any of these demons and this is just a creation of the day guess what it's fucking bullshit the, the Xanax you were talking to me about earlier yeah. where'd you get the Xanax on the street or on the streets so you used to buy that other than Xanax and marijuana what other drugs you ever you never try Xanax um, and marijuana both mellow you out so uh, I, I have yet to, in 23 years, have a case that started out with weed that resulted in um, anything significant happening. You know, like getting angry. You usually get just munchies. Vodka, PCP, cocaine, heroin. No. Okay, Xanax, how many of those did you take when you used to take them? Five. Okay. Five or what, what? That's another bullshit. He did not take five Xanax at one time. He'd be dead. What, what side bar? How big? I mean, which, what color was it? Half sometimes full. Okay, what color? They all white. Fun. White. All right, but that was off the street. Did they help you sleep? It made me drowsy. All right. Did it make the the demon go away? Yeah. When was the last time you think you did Xanax? Long time. So if the Xanax helps you get the demons away. Marijuana does it better. Marijuana does it better? When was the last time you smoked marijuana? Last week. Last week? If you're making twelve hundred dollars a week, why didn't you smoke marijuana every day to get rid of the demon? Illegal. It's illegal? Yeah. And it's illegal. It was illegal whether you do it once a week or once once every five minutes. So why didn't you choose to get rid of the demon by doing it? Anytime you heard the demon, just 
light up a blood. I mean, you had the money, man. Okay. So the demon wanted you to do wrong, but then your good side didn't want to do wrong by smoking marijuana? Even though it made him go away. <laughs> well, I don't know why you didn't tell the doctor then you had anxiety problems and marijuana and Xanax cured your anxiety and made the demons go away. It seemed like an easy fix, man. If that's true. You sure you didn't like the demon voice? You sure? I'm sure. Then why didn't you go to a doctor to get rid of it? I was afraid. I'm just afraid of you. Why, why, why? Well, forget that for a second. Let me ask you another crazy question. Okay. The demon, was the demon there that night? Ian beat, beat you up on campus? Uh -huh. Was the demon there that day when Ian beat you up on campus? Yes. He told me to go up to him. Okay. So, so who did Ian beat up? You were the demon? Me. Okay. So why didn't the demon do something to stop it? Huh? I don't know. That's a good question because the demons. So as you can see, this is kind of drudgery in a sense because you have to wade through a lot of this to get to some good parts, and that's the way it is when you have a criminal case um, and you've got your client's statement. And sometimes they're a couple hours long, and this is actually an hour and fifty-three minutes, I believe. But you have to wade through a lot sometimes, and then we have to get it transcribed and. And uh, you really have – you can't miss certain parts of – because just one little word, one little gesture, one little something or other can, uh, can change the whole meaning of uh, a statement. For example, in My Cousin Vinny, uh, he says, I shot the clerk as a question. But when they bring it in court, what was his response? He said, I shot the clerk. But they, there was an inflection in his voice that went up. So you, you really have to watch these things all the way through. You can do all these bad things. Why couldn't the demon get you mad enough to get the best of Ian? I mean, I don't know. I don't believe it. Doesn't make any sense. I don't know. What was? What was? I don't know. The demons this. I don't know why. All powerful thing that tells you to do bad things and you're afraid of it. Why didn't the demon just take over right then when Ian was getting the best of you and get the best of Ian? Well, why, why, why did the demon not do that? Why do you think? Trying to figure it out. I don't know. I don't. I can't figure it out either because I don't think the demon exists. I I think. I don't think it exists. No, like, I, I think that them, go ahead, go ahead, but. Am I able to, like, think to myself about it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, hey, you can think all you want, I'm just. No, I'm just thinking about the demon. All right, well, you want me, I'll leave you to think for a while, and I'll come back and talk to you. I, I personally, I think you're using the demon as an excuse. I'm not, I promise. You could stop the demon by getting a prescription for marijuana. You could stop the demon by getting a prescription for Xanax. You could stop the demon by illegally doing marijuana, which you were doing anyway. You could stop the demon by doing Xanax illegally, which you were doing anyway. You could stop the demon anytime you want. You didn't want to stop the demon. The subject seems to be coming to the realization that he's not going to be treated as a victim. As he begins to meet this reality, you will notice him exhibit signs of fear. You will then see him attempt to escape the confrontation by feigning a state of psychosis once more. The detective will recognize this, but this time will not afford reassurance. He will instead apply further condemnation, and a visibly frightening realization will engulf the suspect from that point forward. It's essentially the very beginning of retribution. The detective introduces him to the rest of his life at this moment. No, you, you didn't. You could have. I've given you four ways you could have stopped the demon, man. Okay, and now you know you're just acting like that because. No, 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 no. Okay, well, relax. You're just acting like that because I'm making oh. sense. Calm down. 
I'm making sense and you don't like when it makes sense. No, 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 no. Because it doesn't fit into the... See, if his psychotic response is a response to him being outed or, or his, his bullshit isn't working, um, that's another tell that it's not the product of mental illness. You're telling no, right no, now. I'm telling you the story. It's just, it's just true. It's just, well, why are you looking at your arm now? I'm not. Tr I'm trying to understand why. Well, 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 why didn't you want to stop I, the demon? I don't know. <laughs> because you, I think you like the demon. No, I don't. Why didn't you stop it then? I don't like the demon. 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 Well, that's if that's if the demon even exists. Can I get an attorney or something? You want what? An attorney? Yeah. Can I get an attorney? Now he wants a lawyer? Well, it's a little late. But that's, and as soon as when he says, can I get a lawyer, he's got to stop the questioning. Did the, 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 uh, the voice just tell you to get an attorney? Okay. All right, will you tell the voice that don't hit yourself in the head because the, the, the attorney, the, the demon just requested, I will, I will stop talking to you. I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. I'm scared. You're scared of what? I'm scared of what? What? Why wouldn't he protect me, man? I don't know. Why wouldn't he protect me? All right. Well, again, your demon wants an attorney. Does he? Te does he demon know an attorney? Any name in particular? Okay. All right. Well, just relax. You're done talking to me. And once again, I grabbed the wrong key. Right, do me a favor, stay seated, put your hands, kind of sit forward in the chair. I would put handcuffs behind you, since you keep talking about hurting yourself. Hold on, put your hand behind your back. No, no, not behind the chair, behind your back. I don't want to make you that uncomfortable. Well, why don't you want me to hurt myself? Because what did the demon say about me? I'm a nice guy. Nicholas Cruz was taken to the Broward County Jail, where he remains in isolation to this day. His trial date is yet to be scheduled. The 20-year-old has been held without bond since last year's mass shooting that left 17 people dead. His attorney said he would plead guilty in exchange for a life sentence, but prosecutors rejected that offer and are seeking the death penalty. So that was uh, pretending to be crazy. Um, and just so you know, they, it never works. It, it, you know, faking mental illness never works. Never. I've never once seen it work. I've had plenty of cases where um, I had one client who was absolutely convinced that uh, that it was, was when Al Gore ran for president, and he was convinced that uh, he had to go to Washington D.C. because he had some revolutionary idea that would um, I think it had to do with electricity or something. So he went down to the bank. And he demanded uh, a check for $25,000, and he threatened the bank uh, president, and, and they wrote him a check to get rid of him. Uh, and then, obviously, they canceled the check once they, uh, he left the bank, and then they called the police. Well, his delusions were not tied to anything. You know, they weren't tied to trying to hide something or this way. And, and they just – they blurt things out. They just uh, – they have a much more genuine response to – and they're not calculated like this stuff was. So, uh, again, this is Bruce Rivers, criminal defense lawyer here at uh, Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Um, if you are watching this, you should follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. And uh, if you're interested, spread the word. See you next time.